Good evening, viewers, and welcome to the Policy Dex live on BTA. As promised, we always bring you the most insightful analytical discussion, bells discuss and analyze from objective perspective right here on Policy Dex. This is your nation's number one comprehensive uh, expert analytical issues from principally analyzed from your own comprehension. But definitely, we will bring you awesome issues discussing uh, from also, most importantly, uh, we've heard about a lot of issues since the beginning of yesterday uh, when the president, Nana gave the state of the nation's address most people had their own issue had their own perception had their own expectations as to what was really presented by the president but this evening we will be analyzing some of the details and policies that really came to light during his presentation in the house of parliament um, this happens to be his first state of the nation's address or so he told us the state of the nation as has as point as from its perspective but uh what do you believe or what do you think is the state of the nation do you think that is a true state of the nation and if you have an opinion as to the policy that he stipulated likely to come into full fruition uh after the budget is being read on march 2nd uh something that you can let us know your thoughts on the show on 0206 583 547 that is the whatsapp line you can whatsapp into the show 0206 583 547 but first let's go for the mini documentary to tell us really indeed uh, what are we on for this evening so let's go for the mini documentary for ado in his maiden state of the nation address stated that he is prepared and determined to fix the country's challenges he clearly noted that he was not elected by the overwhelming majority of the Ghanaian people to complain about the challenges but rather to fix them in his quest to do this, he made mention of the need for his administration to take up tough and prudent reforms of policies to change the fate of Ghana's economy. Tonight on Policy Desk, we take a look at the various policies in Ghana and suggest which ones need urgent reforms. And now, the discussion begins. Enjoy. We cannot continue this way with our public finances. And I will not allow this economy to collapse under my watch. We will reduce significantly the fiscal deficit this year. Mr. Speaker, Ghana's economic growth has also declined dramatically. Notwithstand the, notwithstanding the record amount of financial resources at the disposal of the previous government. Ghana's GDP growth in 2016, including oil, is estimated at 3.6%. This is the lowest GDP growth in about 23 years. Mr. Speaker, order. Ghana's banking sector <clears throat> has not escaped the economic decline, has become increasingly fragile. Bad loans in the banking sector have risen significantly. Economic and financial data from the central bank show that non-performing loans have risen sharply from 11.2% in May 2015 to 17.3% in December 2016. The recent asset quality review of banks shows significant vulnerability of banks to current economic conditions, with many exhibiting significant weaknesses. Mr. Speaker, low growth, rising rate of unemployment, high fiscal deficits, high and rising debt, and increased depreciation of the CD high cost of food, housing and utilities, and high non-performing loans, amongst others, are symptoms of deeper structural problems that will require a range of reforms, beginning immediately and spanning the short, medium, and long terms. We are going to have to implement some tough, prudent, and innovative...
<laughs> yes, indeed. I was some scenes from the House of Parliament yesterday when the President Nado Dankwa Kufado presented the State of the Nation's address to the Parliament, and that happens to be quite an insightful uh, moment for some Ghanaians. But others have um, some feel to say to that effect. But you can also join us on the show by sending your talk to the WhatsApp line. Your comment is readily acceptable on 0206. 583 let's get your thoughts. But definitely, in the course of the program, we'll be activating the phone lines for you to also join the studios here. Uh, but uh, first and first, you have to make sure your comments are as objective as possible. No name calling, no insult, uh, no uh, foul languages uh, so will be acceptable here, here on, the po on the show. So we advise that. But before I introduce my panelists here, my panel in the studio, let me first take a brief statement that was made by the president. Uh, it appears most people have said a lot about uh, his approach to most of the policy. But let me just take one phrase that he made in, during his presentation. He said, I have heard, a, a quote, I have heard it is said that I am behave, I'm be believing like a man in a hurry. I'm behaving like a man in a hurry. Mr. Speaker, I'm indeed in a hurry. I'm in a great hurry. The times in which we live demand that we all be in a hurry to deal with the problems we face. So that is it for the uh, end of quote, possibly from the President of the Republic of Ghana, Nanado Dankwa Kofado. So let's get straight to the discussion. Privilege to have as my guest this evening, uh, Mr. Paul Jobson is an entrepreneur and is joining me here this evening to discuss, uh, indeed, the details of the State of the Nation Address and what, indeed, Ghanaians uh, are expecting from this new government. Uh, Mr. Jobson, good evening. Welcome to Policy Next. Thank you very much. Long time no see. Well, we've been around. Indeed. Yes. <laughs> you have for your corners more. We've been around minding our business. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Now, uh, Ghana's business is our business. So Definitely. Let's, let's touch on Ghana's business for now. So, uh, you've heard what happened in the House of Parliament. Most expectations was that uh, a lot of details about the state of the nation and how best they could approach it uh, were some of the expectations from the individuals, every ordinary Ghanaian, industry players, and even uh, students because of the po most policies initiative that were being said during this moment. But uh, what is your take on the whole presentation by the president on the state of the nation? Well, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity given me. Let me, first of all, uh, use this opportunity to say a good evening to your cherished viewers and also to thank uh, the management of BTA for inviting me to be part of this very important uh, show to contribute, of course, towards national development. I mean, we are here, I mean, because of the love we have for God and country, Indeed. if not... We definitely will be preparing to jump into our beds. <laughs> but we are here at this time of the night simply because of the love we have for country. Um, I think going straight to the point based on what you asked, let me say that unfortunately for me, mm -hmm. I, I did not have the privilege of watching the or even listening to the State of the Nation's address because of work. Okay. I mean... I personally was in a couple of meetings, and so I didn't have the benefits of uh, listening or watching mm -hmm. the State of the Nation's address. But then I was able to listen to some excerpts of some of the things that transpired, at least this morning. Mm -hmm. I, I was able to listen to a couple of radio stations. I was able to glance through some newspapers. So at least it gave me a fair idea of, I mean, some of the issues that were addressed, mm -hmm. I mean, in the president's uh, uh, address to parliament yesterday. Uh, let me start by saying that, of course, as you and I are aware, I mean, it is not a new thing. Our constitution mandates every president, I mean, to be able to come before parliament and before the whole nation to be able to present to us what we call the state of the nation's address. And of course, the idea behind the address is for the president to be able to let us know where we have come as a country and where we are going. Most especially when we have a new government that has taken over power. And so it is expected that 
the new government through the president, His Excellency, will come and tell Ghanaians that this is exactly where the previous government brought us to. This was where we took over from them. And this is where we are taking Ghanaians to. Mm -hmm. And so that was exactly what the president sought to do yesterday by telling us, I mean, where they intend to take us as a nation. And so I think that what happened yesterday certainly was not anything new to Ghanaians. It was just a fulfillment of what the president is mandated to do as contained in our constitution. You know, before we get into details of the uh, presentation, uh, there was some school of thought that still have holes that uh, indeed uh, some acknowledgement of certain development and that is in the state of the nation address didn't go well with certain uh, parties in the country. That has to do with uh, the, con the contributions made by the past government in terms of some development in the country. Would you say uh, there, were, there haven't been any fairness in the presentation possibly? Well, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity once again. Like I did say yeah. earlier uh, in my uh, introductory uh, uh, speech, I indicated that personally I did not have the privilege of watching the, the or listening to, to the address given by the president. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, but I, with that I, phenomenon, I, I you cannot say, say, you say that. Would you say the fairness wasn't quite addressed? No, well, uh, for me as an individual, yes. I believe strongly that, I mean, if you get an opportunity mm -hmm. to present the state of, of the nation's address like the excellence the president did yesterday, I believe strongly, first of all, it is necessary to acknowledge the good that has been done. To acknowledge the good that you came to meet. And of course also tell us some of the things which you think transpired which were not in the best interests of Ghanaians. And of course the measures you intend to put in place to be able to correct those things that you think were done which were not appropriate. I mean let me give you a typical example. Okay. I mean if you recall before the overthrow of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, Ghanaians, of course, you and I were not there, but we, we, we've read, I mean, we've researched, we've heard about how Ghanaians complained about the fact that they felt Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was not, I mean, leading this country in the right direction. Mm -hmm. For that reason, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown. 100 years has gone by. I think just a few years ago, we celebrated the centenary of yes. Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. And it's amazing that today, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah is celebrated, not just in Ghana, but across the world. I mean, I was privileged to be, to, to be part of uh, the second Pan-African Conference that was organized by the African Society of Oxford University in May 2012. And I was amazed how Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was eulogized at that second Pan-African conference at Oxford University. I was amazed. And as I sat there, I must confess to you that I felt very proud to be a Ghanaian. And fortunately for me, I had my Ghanaian badge on my suit. So I felt very good to be a Ghanaian just because of how Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was, 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 was highly esteemed was eulogized. But then, some years ago, Ghanaians said that, oh, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah hasn't done anything for the country. I mean, he's not leading the country the right direction, in the right direction. And for that matter, he was overthrown. And you and I even know about how, even after his overthrow, all his materials, his books, his articles, everything that had to do with Kwame Nkrumah had to be burnt. Because they, they, they wanted to, to, to wipe out the memory of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. So I'm just saying this to make a point. That you see, I mean, uh, uh, as human as we are, there is no way we can be perfect. We certainly cannot be perfect in our day-to-day -day activities. And so I, I always say this. I was telling somebody just a few weeks ago that uh, governing a nation mm -hmm. uh, can be likened to a parent who is bringing up his children. 
If you are a father or you are a mother at home and you have a child or you have children, there is a likelihood that your child or children may do some good things. It is good and it helps in the upbringing of children when you commend them for the good that they do. And when they do the wrong thing, it is good to reprimand them for the things that they fail to do right. When you do that, it is a good opportunity to bring up your children in a very good environment. Because the child knows that when I do the right thing, I'm congratulated, I'm commended. There are some parents that even when their children go to school and they do well, they don't even see anything extraordinary about it. They think that, after all, I mean, it's expected of you to do well. So if you do well, I mean, why should you be commended? But the point is that in as much as your child did well, some other children did not do well. And so if you are able to commend your child when your child goes to school, speech and prize giving day, your child is given an award. It is good to commend your child for the good he's done. Likewise, when the child does something that is not good, you, 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 you criticize, you, you reprimand the child and let him know that, look, this that you did, this thing that you did was highly unacceptable. And that is how we govern a nation. So in, when, we are, when we are governing a nation, it is necessary that when we take over power from a previous government, you can't tell me that if the government was in power for four years or for eight years, they never did one single good thing. You can never say that. So the good that the previous government did, you commend them for the good they did. And for the things they did which you felt were not good enough, you now tell us Ghanaians that this was what the previous government did which has not helped us as a nation. And for that matter, we are going to put measures A, B, C, D in place to correct that anomaly. And for me, I think that that is the kind of tangent we should go as a nation. Indeed, it was said there. Uh, viewers, you're watching Policy Next Live on BTA. Let's hear your voice. Let's get your conversation going uh, on the WhatsApp line on 0206-583-547. My guest this evening is Mr. Paul Drapson. He's an entrepreneur giving us his perspective on the state of the nation's address. But I'm sure you have yours to share as well. So let's get the discussion going. Let's get the Points being raised, but let's move to a very important aspect of the state of the nation address. But this time around, we know the life uh, line of the nation when it comes to uh, increasing revenue generation for the country has more to do with agri agri sector. There was a lot of conversation about uh, how the farmers have not really gotten to where the standard by which they are supposed to be. Uh, we had most policies that uh, the sector hasn't grown. Last year, the argument then was that uh, the agri sector grew by 0.04%, which some have been described as quite uh, uh, quite not interesting, not quite not uh, good for the nation, which has always boosted uh, agri as its backbone. But what do you say of the president's uh, assertion of the fact that uh, he promises, he, uh, he has a promise or has the uh, policy of ensuring that Agri becomes quite a formidable sector this time around? Thank you very much for the opportunity. I mean, uh, let's face the reality. There is no way any country can develop if that country does not pay attention to Agri and industry. The reason being that a Greek in itself or the Greek sector in itself provides the raw materials that the industries need. And so you realize that I mean uh, there is a correlation between the agricultural sector and the industrial sector because the industrial sector cannot I mean, it's not independent and cannot stand on its own. Likewise, the agricultural sector cannot be independent and cannot stand on its own. They need each other. And so for any nation to be able to progress, for any nation to be able to do well, for any nation to be able to advance, that nation should be able to focus a lot of attention on the agricultural sector and the industrial sector. And so if the president in his address indicated that he is going to put measures in place 
to ensure that, I mean, our agricultural sector uh, experiences some kind of uh, growth, I think it's, it's a step in the right direction. Indeed. I, I have said, I mean, uh, uh, even in this studio before, that we need, even when it comes to agriculture, to begin to reorient ourselves. In what sense? Because you will realize that the sad thing is that, I don't know if you, 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 you are able to watch uh, the Farmers' Day celebrations anytime. I mean, it's shown on television. But if you get the opportunity to participate or to watch any of the Farmers' Day celebrations on television, you will realize that most of the farmers who are awarded are elderly people. People who probably may be in their 50s, getting towards their 60s. It's just on a few occasions you may find one or two young people doing so well so far as the agricultural sector is concerned. Because the young people today, the young people of today do not find the agricultural sector attractive. I have said this before, that when we were in secondary school, those days, Nachimota school, some of our mates, or in fact not some, all our mates who were studying agri science, their mates and friends used to teach them and used to call them farmers. And so you realize that there were some students in Science 5 who were reading a great science. And when you ask them what course they were doing, they wouldn't tell you they were doing a great science. Because they knew that if they tell you that they are doing a great science, you will call them names such as farmer. And so a lot of the youth do not find the agricultural sector attractive enough. But meanwhile, it is so amazing that I personally watched an interview with uh, 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 Mr. Kofi Annan mm -hmm. just, I think, a few months before he finally retired as the Secretary General of the United Nations. And the host of the program asked him a very important question. And the question he asked him was that, so His Excellency, right now that you are almost about proceeding on, on retirement, how do you intend to spend your retirement? And to my amazement, Mr. Kofi Annan said that his plans that he has is that he intends to go into farming when he retires. And I was amazed. What will motivate an outgoing United Nations Secretary General to want to go into farming? It tells you that there is something good about farming. Because if you go to countries like the United States of America, you will discover that the rich people are the farmers. Now, let me take this analogy to ask a very important question. You know, Kofi Annan, in his perspective, or let's say the rich people, the big men, uh, farming, we can say, is a very risky venture to yeah. start off. So if uh, the youth are not going into the farming, probably they lack the uh, capital to uh, advance into such a prospect and it takes long time for you to accrue the needed profit in that dimension so uh, if the youth are not going to look into farming definitely it's likely to be because of capital reasons but how can the government initiative probably be uh, quite incentivizing now for youth to get into uh, this very risky venture would you say well thank you very much once again you see when some of us were young growing up, of course, it doesn't mean we are too old anyway. Mm -hmm. But when, when we were young growing up, I remember we used to have backyard gardens. We used to plant. We used to harvest. Even as I speak to you today, mm -hmm. I still have tomatoes planted in my house that I harvest. I still have some vegetables planted in my house that I harvest. I don't spend money to go and buy them. I harvest them in my house. And so it, it tells you that that interest is completely gone. Like you rightly said, it may be a bit capital intensive to be able to go into, into farming. But of course, those times when we used to have backyard gardens, it did not cost anything to have a backyard garden. 
it didn't cost anything. A lot of people were engaged in subsistence farming. They farm at their backyard to feed their families. In some cases, when their harvest probably was more than they could eat, they probably thought of how best they could sell some in the marketplace. Today, if you take a walk or take a ride through town in Accra, if you visit about 100 homes, I don't think out of the 100 homes, you will even find 10 homes that have backyard gardens. Now, let me bring in this very important uh, aspect of the speech that the president made mention of during his State of the Nation address. He made mention of the fact that there's a policy that he's uh, about to be enrolled fully that has to do with planting for food and jobs. That is a project uh, which has already had an initiative of uh, 125 million Canadian dollars investment uh, to really help in terms of seedling and fertilizer uh, supply. But how formidable uh, would this be uh, as a policy or as a project compared to subsequent projects under the former government? Because we know challenges confronting such uh, a great always centered uh, policy seems to always come with its hiccups. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, any policy or project that encourages the citizenry to engage in be it subsistence farming or large scale farming is a policy that must be commended. In fact, as we speak today, some of our universities even have courses in agribusiness because there's a business aspect of agri. And so you realize that all these are mechanisms by which we can attempt to make the agricultural sector attractive. And so if the president, his excellency, and his government are thinking of a policy or a project which will be geared towards encouraging as many Ghanaians as possible to go into farming, be it small scale or be it large scale, I think it's, it's, it's a laudable idea that needs to be commended. But then also, I think we need to revisit some of the things we used to do in the past. You will recall that a bank like ADB, for instance, Agricultural Development Bank, mm -hmm. the major objective, the, the primary objective for which ADB was established was for ADB to offer support services to those in the farming sector. Today. ADB has become like any other commercial bank mm -hmm. that is competing. They are competing with the other commercial banks. How many people who are into farming, how many people who are into the agricultural sector are even receiving support from ADB? Meanwhile, you and I know very well that the primary motive for which ADB was established was to offer support to our brothers and sisters who were into farming. And so if, if government will be able to source some funding to be able to support people who want to go into farming, either with fertilizer, with manure, with seedlings, with uh, heavy equipment like combined harvesters and whatever, especially when it's a large scale, when, 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 when that farming activity is a large scale activity, I think that it's, it's, it's commendable because at the end of the day, mind you, the only way by which we can be a food sufficient nation is when we are able to encourage a lot of people to go into farming. But mind you also, mind you also, that a country like the United States of America has just about 4% of their total population who are into farming. Just 4%. Look at the kind of things they produce. And some of us even end up <laughs> important from them. Yes, that, that is that is quite true. But let's get to it. Let's touch on a very 
uh, insightful aspect of the, the budget uh, statement that was made as well. You know, the president made mention of the fact that the gap between uh, that is our expenditure compared consistently seems to be widening. There's always a loophole of almost 1.6 uh, billion Ghana cities in terms of how much we always present in the House of Parliament that is in our budget. But, you know, he also made mention of the fact that Ghana owes a lot and we have to uh, address that uh, shortly. And in that sense, will you say we overborrowed what we needed? Because uh, Institute of Fiscal Studies, Association of uh, Ghana Industries, AGI, uh, also in their report attested to the fact that uh, they perceive that this huge risk has the notion of bringing the interest rate higher, therefore making it difficult for them to have access to capital. What is your take on that? Well, I mean, this issue is a two-way affair. You see, government borrowing is equivalent to individual borrowing. And I'll explain. If you wake up tomorrow morning, Winston, and you enter into a bank, and you tell the bank that you need a loan, a loan facility of, say, 50,000 Ghana cities. And they ask you, what are you going to use the loan for? And you tell them that, well, I've seen a very beautiful car out there. And I want to go and buy that car and drive. And the bank decides to give you that money to go and buy that car. The question that you and I may have to ask ourselves is that, how are you going to pay for that loan? Because that car that you have bought to drive is not generating any income for you. Rather, it is taking money away from you. Because every blessed day, you have to buy fuel into the car. If you are not fortunate and there's a problem with the car and you take it to the mechanic shop, you may spend hundreds and thousands of cities just to get it sorted for you. And so instead of that car becoming even an asset, it may end up becoming a liability. But if you walk into the bank and the bank asks you, Winston, the 50,000 Ghana cities you are asking us to give you, what are you going to use the money for? And you tell the bank that, well, um, I want to open up a shop to be able to buy and sell. Mm -hmm. Then you and I can comfortably say that that money that the bank is going to give to you as a loan, you are going to trade with it. And so long as you trade with it, you are going to get returns on that money. And the returns you get on that money is what will enable you to pay the loan. So as a nation, if we go in for loans, and the loans that we go in for are used to buy cars for government officials to drive. They are used to buy uh, or build houses for government officials to sleep in comfortably. They are used to uh, renovate something that, I mean, a state institution is used to renovate a state institution. Then you and I know that that money is gone for good. But if the nation goes in for a loan, and the nation says that, the government says that, look, the loan we have gone in for is a loan that we are going to use to construct mm -hmm. or to build a hospital. At the end of the day, when people visit the hospital, they will pay to be saved. Of course, you and I know that even though we have the health insurance, in spite of the health insurance, mm -hmm. there are people who still go to the hospitals and they pay to be saved. So monies that are paid by patients to these hospitals, those monies can be used to pay for the loan facility. For instance, just yesterday, I was in a conversation with uh, one of the station managers of one of the airlines operating in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And 
I was shocked by what he told me. He told me that Ghana Airport Company charges them $70 per passenger as an airline. So assuming government decides to go for a loan, we now have Terminal 3 under construction. If government decides to go for a loan to even construct Terminal 4, you and I know that that loan can be paid for easily. Because if the Ghana Airport Company Limited is charging each passenger $70, it's charging the airlines $70 per passenger, let us research to find out how many travelers pass through our airports on a daily basis. Let us check to find out how many travelers pass through our airport annually. So are That's what can be paid for. Are you saying that uh, we are where we are at the moment because of uh, we're not adapting to a proper loan repayment strategy uh, as a country? No, well, you see, the issue is that, I mean, when, when, when you go in for a loan, and let's say the repayment period is 20 years. God forbid, if you should die after 15 years, it means that your children may have to pay the remaining five years. If you use that money to buy a car to sit in, to drive, how do your children pay that loan facility? But assuming you use that money, like we said, to trade, and that trade is still ongoing, even when you're not around, because the trade is still ongoing, your children can still be using returns from that trade to pay off the loan facility. But then you have also inconvenienced your children because you've gone in for a loan facility where the repayment period is 20 years or 50 years. And so if we are going in for loans as a country, mm -hmm. we need to be able to look at repayment periods that will be suitable for us as a nation. Because mind you, the little knowledge I have when it comes to finance is that sometimes it doesn't make sense to pay outrightly if you have the money. For instance, if, an, if, 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 if a real estate company comes and says, we are selling a two-bedroom house for $50,000, but you can pay 25%, and we will spread the remaining amount over a period of five years for you to pay. If I have $50,000 sitting in my bank account, wisdom will tell me not to take all the $50,000 to go and pay. I will rather go and pay the 25%, invest the remaining 75%. The interest that I will make on my investment can be paying the amount of money I need to pay monthly. So in five years' time, I would have finished paying for the house. I would have the house and the 75% of the money will still be sitting in my account. Because mind you, I only use 25% to pay the down payment of 25%, and I still have the 75% in my account. And so, I have gotten the house, I still have my money. And that's, that's one of the wisest ways sometimes to go about things. And so as a nation, assuming we go in for a loan facility, and we can even pay the loan immediately, in one year, in two years. We can service the loan in one year or two years. Sometimes wisdom may tell you that if the money is there to pay, why don't you negotiate a long-term repayment period so that you can even invest the money? As even I invest the money and every month, even the interest I'm making on the investment every month is, say, is, is even $5,000 every month. The interest alone is about $5,000. Can't the interest service the loan? So if I have a repayment period of 20 years, it means that the interest I'm going to be making on my investment every month is what is going to be paying for the loan. But the principal is still there, which has not been touched. So sometimes the advantages of having repayment periods that, that, that are a bit longer is that it helps you to trade with the money. 
so that the interest you, you get on your principal can be used to service the loan. But if you have a short-term repayment period, then what it means is that it, it denies you the opportunity to, 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 to trade with the money. So if the money is there, you have to take the 50000 go and pay the 50000 After paying the 50000 the money is gone and gone for good. Indeed. Very insightful submissions there. If you're watching us in your homes, anywhere you are, we are live on our Facebook page as well on Business Television Africa. Just go and like the page on Facebook and you'll be having live streaming coming to you live on our Facebook page as well. This is Policy Dex. Uh, my name is Winston Nitaki. We bring you insightful uh, perspective on how the state of the nation uh, really is from objective perspective. Uh, indeed, there were a lot of submissions, a lot of comments. Uh, popularly, Doomsaw didn't really leave come <laughs> or didn't even hide itself during the presentation. But it appears there's a new perception or approach that the president intends to take. That is listing companies such as Gridco, VRA on the Ghana Stock Exchange. How formidable would it be? Uh, there's been a lot of contention. If, indeed, should that be the way forward? Uh, how viable will it be and how sustainable, considering the fact that the board of uh, directors will also be appointed? But let's get to the discussion right here. But you can also let us hear your voice on 0206-583-547. Uh, shortly, we'll be activating the phone lines for you to call and make your submissions as well on what you think uh, is your state of your nation, Ghana. So let's get straight to the discussion. Now, now to the power sector. For the past four years, we've seen a lot of investment in the sector. Government has tried, that is the past government under the former President Mahama, uh, to address this issue. We saw power budgets coming to the country. We saw more power plants being invested in. Even the, con the whole conversation about privatizing certain aspects of the electricity campaign of Ghana and also uh, some well-structured power sectors all came to light. So, so far, so good. Would you say uh, this option, because of uh, the assertion that most of the energy uh, stake enterprises in the country are hugely indebted, and this gives it an option for us to list it on the Ghana estate, uh, stock exchange market, is that a right approach from your perspective? Yeah, thank you very much yeah. for the opportunity. I mean, the issue is that uh, when it comes to every nation, yes. certain things are key. No nation can develop without power, without energy. When you have a situation where energy supply is not stable, your cost of doing business goes very high. I mean, I have, I've mentioned this, this on, on this st uh, 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 particular station before, mm -hmm. when we used to have this uh, Dumso. I had a friend who used to in fact, not use it because he still works there anyway. I mean, he works with one of the oil marketing companies. And according to, to him, he was telling me that every week they were spending not less than 1,800 Ghana cities to buy fuel to service their generating plant. Every week. Apart from that, what they were paying to ECG every month was nothing less than 2,000 Ghana cities. But because the power supply was not very stable, let us even assume the 2,000 will reduce to 1,000 Ghana cities. Every week they spend 1,800, multiplied by four weeks. At the end of every month, how much are they spending on just generating energy supply to be able to work efficiently? So you realize that when, 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 when you don't have power supply as, as, as a company or when industries don't have power supply, their cost of doing business always goes up. Secondly, you and I need to be mindful of the fact that some 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40, 50 years ago, as a nation, we depended heavily on hydroelectric power. Now, the cost of producing hydroelectric uh, 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 electric power is very cheap. Very, 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 very cheap. Unfortunately for us, because of climate change, most of our water bodies are drying up. And so they are not able to produce at full capacity 
you realize that even Akosombo Dam, at the time Akosombo Dam was constructed, I mean, under, the, under, under Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, Akosombo Dam was constructed specifically to save Valco and 4 million Ghanaians. Today, we are about 27 million. So it is very obvious that the Akosombo Dam that was serving Valco and 4 million Ghanaians certainly cannot serve 27 million Ghanaians. I always give this example. It's like a household. Winston, you are not married now. <laughs> so maybe every day you can choose to spend 20 Ghana cities. Yeah, put me on the market. I'm selling you. <laughs> so okay. in case anybody's interested, they can come for interview. Thank you, anyway. <laughs> but I mean, on, on a more serious note, yes. assuming that, I mean, you decide as a single man, I want to spend 20 Ghana cities every day to eat, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Maybe very soon, a wife comes in, so you are now two. And you still feed yourself and your wife with 20 Ghana cities, morning, afternoon, and evening. Along the line, one child comes in. So from one, you have now increased to three. And you still feed the three with 20 Ghana cities. The next time you realize a second child comes in, the family size has grown from one to four. And you still feed the family with 20 Ghana cities, morning, afternoon, evening. What do you think will happen? you will now begin to do food rationing. If you used to get two ladles or three ladles of rice, you may now get one ladle of rice because it has to be shared in such a way that everyone will get something to eat. So it's the same with our energy sector. The Akosombo Dam that used to serve 4 million Ghanaians and Valco we cannot expect that same Akosombo down to serve 27 million Ghanaians. And so you realize that, like you rightly mentioned, the previous government now began to think of how they could think of other sources of energy to be able to solve our energy uh, problems or crisis. We now went into thermal energy because, like I rightly said, I mean, due to climate change, our water bodies also began to dry up. So we also began to go into thermal energy. But mind you, with thermal energy, we have to power our thermal plants with crude oil. And the cost of crude oil is very expensive. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, even though government is able to provide us with power, it is expensive to maintain that power. Excuse me. It's expensive. Mm -hmm. And so if we want to have a power sector that will be sustainable, what I think we need to do is that we need to begin to have a comprehensive policy which will be devoid of political parties. Because you see, there are certain sectors of the economy that we cannot, we cannot toil with. If you recall, some years ago, and this is just to buttress this point, some, a couple of years ago, we said we were changing from the sixth form to secondary school. Yes. Secondary school was made three years. If you remember, there was a particular badge of people who did secondary school two and a half years, and that was my badge. My badge, we, we were the only badge that did two and a half years secondary school. Then, at another point in time, another government came and said, we want to make it four years. It became four years. Another government came, they said, we are reverting it to three years. And it became three years. And I have said it before. If we are not careful, one day, somebody may become president and say, okay, well, I think that we want to make secondary school education. One year, what do we do? So we need to have comprehensive policies 
Because if you go, if you, if you travel abroad, if you go to the Europe's and the Americas and what have you, the number of years you go to school doesn't change because a new government has come to power. Because they have comprehensive policies. You know, uh, indeed, we can have policy, but uh, like you may mention the fact that policy have not stayed or be tested uh, or tried the test of time. Um, therefore, for upon change of government, there has been always inconsistent sustainability of these policies. But would you say we've not systemized our policy to adjust to our current dispensation, irrespective of which government we are? Or do you see that we've lost focus? from our nationalistic perspective as to where we want to go. We've seen most countries' development being based on the structure of the education. Is it what is missing in our limelight? Yeah, thank you. You see, the, 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 the issue is that it bogs down to the fact that as a nation, we do not have a comprehensive national development plan. Of course, we thank God that NDPC currently is trying to do something. But we don't have a national development plan. And so when political parties contest for elections and they are voted into power, they come into power with what they call their political party manifesto. And so at the end of the day, I mean, you and I have even heard on several occasions how in the media people will say that political party A promised that when they are voted, they will do A, B, C, D. So now that they have been, they have been uh, elected, they must fulfill their campaign promise at all costs. So it has been reduced to fulfillment of political party manifesto and not fulfillment of a national agenda because there is no national agenda. But if we have a national development plan which has a comprehensive policy on education, which has a comprehensive policy on energy, which has a comprehensive policy on health, which has a comprehensive policy on sanitation, it doesn't matter which government comes and which government goes. That policy will still be maintained. That policy would still work. I mean, look at how filthy and dirty our environment is. I mean, I was doing a research some time ago, and I discovered that this pure water sachet robbers takes up to 25 years to decompose. This plastic water bottles, plastic mm -hmm. uh, water bottles, takes up to 700 years to decompose. So the question I asked myself was very simple. If this pure water sachet robbers takes 25 years to decompose, then you can imagine how filthy and dirty Ghana will be. And if these plastic bottles take 700 years, up to 700 years to decompose, then you can imagine how filthy and dirty Ghana will be. Because we have not even been able to find a solution as to what to do with them. When you travel to, to countries like India, they are able to transform this into lubricating oil. They are able to use pure water sachet rubbers, these uh, plastic bottles, they are able to use them as raw materials to produce lubricated oil for car engines, for generators, for drilling machines. Over here, what do we do with it? We don't even know what to do with it. And so if we have a national development plan that has a comprehensive policy framework on sanitation, on health, on energy, on education, on housing, it doesn't matter which government will come and which government will go. Any government that comes would still have to work having that policy framework at the back of their minds. Indeed, uh, policy framework formulation. Are we having the tough and prudent policy formulation strategies uh, for the nation? How formidable are they and how prudent could they stand the test of time? So we discuss on this issue. My guest this evening is Mr. Paul Drapson, an entrepreneur, giving us insightful uh, insight, uh, ideas on how best the nation can best be run from an objective perspective. So uh, about right about now, uh, the phone lines have been activated. So you can call into the show on 030-221-409, 030-221-409. Let's go for our first commercial break. When we come back, let's get you going here on Policy Lake. Stay tuned.
Side catering, recreation, look no further than Coconut Grove Beach Resort Hotel, located in Elmina. Coconut Grove Hotels, memories worth repeating. Coconut Grove Hotels, memories worth repeating. Welcome back to Policy Dex Live of BTA, bringing you insightful analysis of critical economic issues. This time around, we're touching on tough and prudent policy formulation, uh, Ghana's economy in perspective. We've touched on various aspects. We've spoken about uh, the energy sector. We've also touched on education. Uh, you know, most issues about loan that has been quite topical over the years, something well addressed by Mr. Paul Drabson here with me in the studio. Uh, let me take your messages that have come through the WhatsApp line. Uh, the number is, again, is 206 583 3547 that is a whatsapp line but you want to call in the show let us get your submission as well on 030 2211409 some insightful messages coming through the whatsapp line as well one says uh good evening my dearest brother and your crew the moment a country decides to go for imf it means the managers have failed in managing the economic affairs of the country and therefore house over the country to be managed by the imf the new government must cut down our expenditure so that we don't have uh, we don't have over the country uh, to IMF again. Politicians buying state property, council of state is a complete waste of taxpayers' money, etc. This message is from Daniel Aj from Akwasi, Akwasi, okay, Akwasi. I almost say a quasi. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting one there. He also said, a good evening and thank you so much for a wonderful topic. It is high time for our leaders to begin to have foresight. Parliament is the main brain behind Ghana's poor performance in terms of everything after 60 years of independence. It is very true that Ghana is just struggling. We need pragmatic and good laws. All right, kindly attach your name next time. I think, let me take another one. Um, this is by TRK from Kumasi. Um, I don't think listing Gritco on the stock exchange will solve the car situation. Gritco's problem 
has to do with non-payment by ECG, but ECG uh, is owed by government big time. Gritco has been declaring profit every year. You can check from State Enterprise Commission. Okay, that is a very informative uh, submission there. Another one, okay. Uh, let me take another one. It says, I fully agree with your guess on having to convert plastics into meaningful product, but we must have the technology first, uh, which we lack. Secondly, it is unfortunate that Ghanaian scientists are mostly deck scientists. That, <laughs> <laughs> that is a very interesting one there. Thirdly, those who's those who's, uh, who have done the research do not have the funding, and so all remain a pamphlet of ideas. Good evening. This is from Bruce uh, from Banana Inn. Thank you, Bruce, for sending your message. Uh, okay, you can also, okay, another one says, Educative, I'm loving the contribution of the guest. This is Bismarck uh, sending a message from Dadia. So, I like his comment on loans, all right? Uh, you can also be active with us here on Policy Dex uh, on 0206 583 The numbers are under your screens. Now, the phone lines have been activated. Uh, let us get your thoughts and comments. Uh, you can phone in into the show. That is, if you're watching us on Facebook as well, so you're live and let us get your thoughts on 030. 2211409. Now let's move to a very important aspect. We've always, you go to every community, you find the rules on TAD. Uh, the, the question is who is in charge of your rules? How critical are rules to ensuring the marketability of producers from hinterlands to mainlands to urban centers? How is rules critical to urbanization? And also, some have continuously spoken about. Uh, the importance of uh, connecting towns and cities. And so this time around, let's touch on guard roads. We've seen most investment in roads. We've seen most infrastructures. Uh, one quite uh, last year that was uh, opened by the former president has to do with the circle interchange. That was quite insightful. Uh, we've seen a lot of roads also in Kumasi, most parts of the country. But you know, first of all, let's understand. Some have said roads are just roads. But are roads just roads and how do they play a critical role in economic uh, activities and market uh, orientation possibly? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it is quite sad sometimes when you hear people say that are we going to eat roads or is a road going to put money into my pocket? Because you see, assuming you buy a brand new car, mm -hmm. assuming you buy a brand new car, and you live in an area where the road is very bad, the rate of depreciation will be faster. The car will depreciate at a faster rate. You may go to the mechanic shop every two weeks. Assuming the car, that the road were to be in a very good condition, maybe you may go to the mechanic shop every two months or even three months for regular servicing. But when the road is not good, you may find yourself visiting the mechanic shop almost every two or three weeks. Now, if you visit the mechanic shop every two weeks or three weeks, when you go and they tell you, well, this thing is damaged, we need to buy this, we need to replace this part, we need to buy this, buy that, and you pay a thousand Ghana cities. That thousand Ghana cities could have been invested in something else, which would have been much more beneficial to you as an individual. Like you rightly said, even sometimes when you go to the hinterland, some of our mothers, our fathers, brothers and sisters who are farmers, will harvest their produce, which are also perishable in nature. And sometimes how to transport it even into the cities, into the town centers, into the marketplace to sell is a problem. I mean, I was talking to somebody sometime last week. And I was telling the person that I personally had the privilege of traveling to a particular village uh, in Ghana, somewhere in the eastern region after Akimoda, mm -hmm. it's about one hour drive from Akimoda. I don't want to mention the name of the village for the purpose sure. of the discussion. At the time I went there in 2004, to my amazement, commercial vehicles came to that village once a week. 
the road was in a very deplorable state. There was no clinic or no hospital in that village. The nearest and closest hospital was the Akimoda Government Hospital, which was about one hour drive from that village. I personally witnessed a woman in labor who delivered on somebody's veranda. Fortunately, there was a man in the village, one man in the village, who was the only person who owned a taxi. After 9 p.m., he was the one they went to knock on his door if he could come with his taxi and rush the woman and the baby she has just delivered to the Akimoda Government Hospital. Commercial vehicles went there once a week. And I'm not talking about what somebody told me, but I'm talking about what I personally experienced. So if you have farmers in that kind of community, they have harvested their crops, which are perishable in nature. Commercial vehicles come there once a week. <laughs> if, assuming the commercial vehicles come on Thursdays mm -hmm. and they harvest on Friday, it means they have to wait till the following Thursday. By the following Thursday, if their crops are perishable, some of them would have already gone bad. But you realize that when roads are constructed, vehicles that were not interested previously in, plow, in plying those roads, all of a sudden become interested in plying those roads. So a place where commercial vehicles used to go there once a week, simply because the road is constructed, commercial vehicles now may go there on a daily basis. So if you are a farmer and you harvest your produce, you know that it is not difficult to transport your produce into the town centers and into the markets to sell. And so roads are also very necessary and they play a major role when it comes to the development of any nation. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, some of the problems personally I have is that if you pass through Accra and if you are very, very conversant with Accra, you will discover that there are a lot of access routes. A lot of access routes. And almost all the access routes I know in Accra are in a very, very, very bad and deplorable state. Now, let's chip in this very important aspect of road construction. Uh, you know, anytime we see roads, you know, you wake there at times that it takes time. For instance, on the one road that I, I see it took a lot of years to get construction was the one uh, before Legon, that is the Legon Road, where the overhead was constructed, it took many years to become almost about four years or so. But the quality of it is undeniable. There are many roads you find in most of our communities. Within three days, the roads have been constructed, and not too long, you find loopholes, potholes, and you wonder what the taxpayers pay us money for. Would you say the contractors, uh, the contractors to which this uh, particular contract are being given? do not really assess or are not really assessed by government. Therefore, a decentralized system will be a better way to know who and whom is really constructing these rules as at the moment. Yeah, thank you very much. You see, um, monitoring and evaluation is very necessary. Because sometimes, and, and you know this, sometimes when you even contract a mason to come and build something for you. Maybe you have a plot of land, you want to put up some structure, at least where, where you can lay your head. And you decide to bring in a mason to come and construct it for you, come and build it for you. The mason may tell you that we need 10 bags or 20 bags of cement to be able to do this particular job. You make money available to buy 20 bags of cement but in reality what the mason might have used would have been like seven or eight bags meanwhile 
He told you that what is needed is about 20 bucks to enhance the quality of work they are doing. You, you've made money available for 20 bucks and they use only 8 bucks. Maximum 10 bucks. The rest of the money goes into his personal pocket. So if you have a situation where some of our roads are awarded to some of our contractors, who is responsible for monitoring? Who is responsible for evaluation? Because the contractor can say that, well, we may need about 500 bags of cement to construct this road. But at the end of the day, he may end up using 200 bags of cement. The money for 300 bags of cement goes into his personal pocket. How are you able to determine that he did not use 500 bags of cement, but he used 200 bags of cement? That is where monitoring and evaluation is very necessary. Secondly, there are a lot of people sometimes who are awarded contracts and they have absolutely no background, no knowledge, no expertise when it comes to road construction. They will get the contract and they will also sublet the contract to somebody else. To a third party. So the contract is given to me. I know I don't have the expertise. I know I can't do it. But you have the expertise. And I subcontract it to you as a third party to deliver. Legally speaking, the government who awarded the contract doesn't know you. Because nobody gave a contract to you. They know me. The contract was given to me. So even if they want to do any evaluation, they do it with me. If they need any report, I'm the one to present a report. Meanwhile, I'm not the one doing the job. So how do I present a report of a job I'm not doing? So I now rely and depend on you to present the report to me for me to also present to the government or to the awarding, the awarding body. At the end of the day, when you give me the, the, the report, I may not even read the report. I receive it from you, and I pass it on to the awarding body. So if we have a situation like this, how do you expect that roads that are constructed will last? I mean, like you rightly mentioned, look at roads like Temamoto Way. When was Temamoto Way constructed? But you and I can confirm that very little work has been done on the motorway ever since it was constructed because the quality of work that was done was good. You know, let me ask this question. You know, when the uh, cycle interchange was about to be constructed, I took, before it got started, you know, then uh, when I was younger, that's my angle. I used to go and sit there and just meditate and think, have my quiet time. So when the change was about to happen, I took the people to walk around in the evenings and daytime to see uh, what really are the workers doing. And to my surprise, I realized that when they are digging the hole for the pillar, they dug to a point where they found out that they found six feet down deep, uh, the foundation there. And I asked some of the engineers, they told me that this foundation was there since Kogogi's back time. And therefore, all they had to do was just erect it and build the overpass. Meaning that we had a plan for this interchange many years ago. But just that, I don't know what kept that moving. So this has to do with the town and council planning, country planning. So in this instance, we have the plans for developing Accra, the capital city of Ghana, already there. And it took less than six or seven months to get this project going and fully functional. Then look at Ghana is getting to 60. We are 60 years now. So if you could take less than a year to construct a bridge of this nature, then how long have we, why have we been waiting all these years to get ourselves moving see, and get our towns developed? It's a very, very important issue you have raised. I mean, a few years ago, I, was, I, was, I, 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 I had a discussion with uh, one professor, yes, uh, Professor Araba Apt. 
She used to be the head of sociology department at the University of Ghana, Legon. But at the time I had a discussion with her, she was then at Ashesi University. And I think she was then also the dean of students at Ashesi University. And we were having a discussion because she had written a book and she had actually even given me a personal copy of the book. Amazingly, in her book, she talks about how somewhere in the 70s, in the 60s, 70s, there were plants that were put in place, plants that were developed in terms of the development of Accra. All the plants were there. As far back as the 1960s, 1970s, those plants were there. And in our discussion, she told me that, Paul, all those documents, unfortunately, are in bookshelves gathering dust. We are in 2017. You'll be monitoring the media and you will discover that people are still attending workshops, conferences, and seminars on the redevelopment of Accra. As we speak, workshops and seminars and conferences are still being organized in connection with the redevelopment of Accra. Meanwhile, as far back as the 1960s, 1970s, all those plants were there. If we really want to implement the plants, why don't we revisit the plants that were, were, were initiated as far back as 1960s, 1970s? And those plants are gathering dust. It appears every government wants to be seen to be working or doing something. Therefore, uh, this seminar seems to be like a dress rehearsal to the whole, I've, thought, I've done nothing. <laughs> no, it's a problem. Yeah. It's a serious problem because the issue is that, you see, even today, and you are aware of this, there are some places that when there is a fire outbreak and the fire service is called upon to come and put off the fire, sometimes the fire service even gets to a point and they cannot even penetrate. Because places that are supposed to be roads mm -hmm. have been occupied by buildings. And so the fire service has to go and put off fire somewhere and the road is blocked. They can't move. Mm -hmm. This tells you that indeed, I mean, we have not paid too much attention when it comes to the development of our city. Mm -hmm. If you remember, even under the time, and, under, under pre, uh, former President Kufour, President Kufour, I remember, appointed um, the late Jacob Echebilante as the Minister for Tourism and Modernization of the Capital City. With all due respect, let us ask ourselves, how well was the capital city modernized mm -hmm. and so it comes back to the issue we were talking about earlier about a comprehensive national development plan indeed you know two weeks ago i had the privilege of as a journalist you know uh what bank presented released a report that has to do with uh urbanizing our cities into the intermediate 21st century standard and they took into consideration some key factors they took job creation as one that is urbanization they took into consideration uh, electricity supply and making sure that businesses are also addressed and one very critical aspect that they they made mention of the fact that when towns and cities are well structured with the intent of industrialization uh, definitely the issue of unemployment will be resolved and that brings us to the next topic that has to do with unemployment Ghana, every government upon government there's no political party that never campaigns based on job creation now this time around we've seen the looming number of youth unemployment in the country we've had conversation upon some of the report that we've had about how synchronizing academia uh, with uh, industry you know it appears Every time an unemployment issue comes, the goalposts the goal seem to be shifting here and there, confusing the whole rhetorics about 
Job. What is job? First of all, let's get that definition right. When they say you have a job, what is job? Is yeah. it a job? Some have a conversation with job and work. Is it the same definition? Is it the same meaning? If you, are, uh, if you have a work, are you, uh, is it the same as job? What, I, what is the real rhetoric? Where have come politicians come and mix the whole understanding, confusing the populace? Yeah, you know? thank you very much. You see, I may be a bit controversial on this matter. Sure. But I believe strongly that, I mean, the point would still be well made. Honestly speaking, even there are people who are working who don't even deserve to be where they are. They don't deserve to be where they are because they were never interested in doing what they are doing now. For instance, and I will, I will, I will, I will, I will do a perfect analysis, analysis for you. When people, a lot of, when a lot of times when people complete secondary school, normally the idea is to proceed to the university. For most people, if they are unable to gain admission to the university, the next place they look at is polytechnic. If they are unable to gain admission to the polytechnic, the next place they look at is nursing training college. If they are not able to gain admission to nursing training college, then they look at teacher training college. So you realize that somebody may go to the nursing training college to train to become a nurse, not because he or she is interested and have always been interested in wanting to become a nurse or a health professional. The reason why he or she went to the nursing training college was because government was paying allowances. Maybe his or her parents probably could not afford to take him or her to the university or polytechnic because even though he passed and passed well, the money to pay for university or polytechnic was not there. So the parents said, oh, then go to nursing training college because after all, government gives allowances to students. So the reason why somebody goes to the nursing training college may be because probably either his parents could not afford to take him to university or polytechnic and they felt, okay, then let me go to the nursing training since government gives allowances to students. Mm -hmm. Or somebody may choose to go to the nursing training college because he or she feels that, oh, Charlie Nancy Ejmeni, oh. nowadays there are no jobs. But if you can go to nursing training college, when you finish school, your job is guaranteed. Likewise, oh, if you go to the teacher training college, if you finish the teacher training college, your job is guaranteed. So if somebody goes to the nursing training college or teacher training college, either because the parents could not afford university or polytechnic, or he or she did not get a very good pass to gain admission to the university or polytechnic, but rather went to the nursing training college on the basis that Charlie and saying nurses, they paid them very, very, very well. Now, now right now, because of single spine salary structure, so I mean, the salary that nurses are taking is, is good. So let me go and, 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 and become a nurse. After all, even when I finish nursing training college, getting a job will not be a problem. If that is the mindset for somebody going to the nursing training college, we are in trouble. Secondly, if somebody goes to teacher training college simply because his or her parents could not afford university education, polytechnic education, and for that reason he went to teacher training college, or he went to teacher training college specifically because he doesn't have the money and government will pay allowances. Mm -hmm. Or he didn't get good passes and yes, so rather we'll decided to go to mm -hmm. the teacher training college. Then we are in trouble. I have always said that somebody like me, one of the things I cannot stand is blood. I can't stand blood. Mm -hmm. So it's obvious that if you put me in a hospital environment, you are worried me. I can't work. There is no way I can ever work in a hospital environment. Even sometimes the smell, there's the smell of the hospital environment even makes me sick. Even though I'm somebody who, 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 who is tender and, and, and care for people, but then I cannot stand blood. So it's obvious that the hospital environment is not the kind of place for me. Somebody goes to join the police service or military simply because 
he or she just wants something to do to make ends meet. If you go in for a job simply because you want to make ends meet, then we are in trouble. How many people today do what they do because they are passionate about what they do? Look, if we should conduct a survey now, if the government should put a team together to conduct a survey now, I can assure you that out of 100%, we may get about 70% who may tell you that they are not interested in what they do. They are doing what they are doing just to make ends meet. So when it comes to jobs, mm -hmm. I have always said, as an entrepreneur, I have always said that no government can single-handedly solve the problem of unemployment because unemployment has graduated from becoming a national issue to becoming a global issue. No government. A government can attempt to do something, but no government can single-handedly. You know, we'll come to the why and how. Because if that is the case, then we have a huge tax on our head to resolve as a country. So, uh, viewers, you're watching Policy Dex live on business television, Africa BTA. My um, guest this evening is Mr. Paul Drapson. He's an entrepreneur. You see how insightful and passionate he is about national issues. And so, if you are also having some talk to share with us, the phone lines have been activated. You can call into the show on 030 221409. 030 one one four zero nine. The WhatsApp lines are also uh, quite active. Getting messages from all parts of the country uh, coming through the WhatsApp line on zero two zero six five eight three five four seven. Let me take some from. Uh, this is from Susie in Kwabunya. Says, interesting program. I have just tuned in. Very informative. Please, can the government bring back the town council, uh, whereby the laws will be enforced for us to clean up? Accra is too filthy to even think about introducing new projects. Uh, let's clean up our city, make it law to the pe so, so that people should be prosecuted and fined on the spot for throwing rubbish and spitting in the streets. I know it will take a miracle for it to happen, but I think in this instance, forces should be applied between your guests. Uh, Okay, your guest on the show talks a lot of sense. Uh, thank you, Susie, for sending such a message. Uh, I think that is a very important one. Law enforcing, enforcing agencies in the, in the country needs to be up and doing. It's from uh, Suntam Enusa, Enusa in um, Boku says, I'm enjoying your, your discourse. On the note of the job and work, let's refer to the scripture where God commanded Adam to be productive or to work. Work is our God-given talent expressed in service to humanity. Uh, job, however, on a lighter note, just means uh, over broke. Okay. Just over broke. Just over broke. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Let me take it again. Job, however, on a lighter note, just means just over broke. Means just over broke. Interesting <laughs> aspect there. Let me take another one also. It's um, Betty. says, I think uh, the president failed to acknowledge the good works of former President GM. Uh, your guest is fantastic and, and I'm, jo I'm enjoying the show. Uh, Betty, thanks for sending your message there. Uh, another one says, uh, There is nothing wrong with Ghana's economy. Corruption and a huge amount of money is given to MPs and ministers is the root of all our problems. This is Barnabas Sabugo from WA. Sending the message from WA. Uh, and another one, uh, let me take another message. Uh, Daniel J. in Kwase says, Nobody says that road construction are not good. Uh, Ghana ought to have... Uh, have Ghana ought to have had good roads all over the country long time. The leaders have taken the citizens for granted. Like if you wanted good road, and then vote for me, and this is very bad. We pay taxes in Ghana more than the Western world. So why is it that Ghana cannot boast of anything good after 60 years of independence? Politicians in this country must change. <laughs> um, take another, uh, uh, I think some few ones as well. This Kwesi says, we appear not to be and be a serious nation. Visit Tono in the Upper East region and see the huge national irrigation dam built by Kutu, uh, Kutu and Champo, uh, which has been left in a deplorable state as a nation. It is just so sad that this project alone can create so many jobs for the teeming unemployed youth. Our generation is, to, be, to me, uh, the most savage in our quest to earn a living. We just don't love our nation and don't care about the national 
uh, the future generation this thank you so much for sending your messages keep your messages coming through the phone lines have also been activated uh, you can call into the show on 030 uh, let's first of all get your name and where you're calling from keep sending your messages as well you know and uh, very important we're going through the messages uh it points out that every aspect of the message somehow links to leadership now let's delve on how leadership uh, plays a critical role in ensuring that the lives of the individual the growth of the country various demands from various sectors the health sector and all the various critical aspects of ensuring that the standard of living the growth of the country is inclusive where the individual feels the impact of the growth in its livelihood there and nights irrespective of which policy or which government comes to the power now sustaining growth and making sure that this growth is inclusive most people from most part of the regions have sent their messages some have attested to the fact that the reality in their community community is something you can't write home about but you know leadership leadership is a very important aspect of transformation yeah in Ghana's case, is it the citizens, is it the followers that are not checking the leaders or the leaders are not listening to the followers or both have lost sight of the goal? Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. I, and just uh, please permit me, sure. just before I, I, I delve into the leadership issue, mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I want to quickly make a point about this job issue. Please do because that. Because certainly as an entrepreneur, it's an area that is of major interest to me. And I'm, 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 I'm very excited about the message that Inusa from Boko sent mm -hmm. when he indicated that indeed job is an abbreviation which just means just over broke. <laughs> and, and, and before God and man, you see, yes. what I meant, what I'm, I, I even tried to, to, to mean when I, said, when I said that no government can single-handedly deal with the issue of unemployment is that find out how many students graduate from our tertiary institutions annually. Recently, I was, I was listening to a program, and somebody mentioned, I don't know how true it is, but it could be true, somebody mentioned that every year, not less than 50,000 students graduate from our tertiary institutions every year. But interestingly, each and every individual has what we call a God-given gift talent or potential. God has given everybody a gift, a talent or a potential. It is up to us to be able to help our brothers and sisters to discover what their God-given gift, talent and potential is. And how can we help them to add value to their God-given gifts? I mean, look at somebody like uh, 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 John Dumelo. John Dumalo was my junior in Achimota school. But he's making far more money than I'm making today. Mm -hmm. He's more connected than I am today. He has been to places I have probably never been there before. Because of his gifts. And so we, we need to begin to look at how best we can help our younger brothers. Look, I used to have a friend who was my mate in school. He's now a magistrate court judge. This guy was a good artist he can look at you as you are sitting down like this and draw you perfectly i'm sure probably because of his job as a judge magistrate court judge he probably might have thrown his drawing away but can you imagine how much money that that kind of drawing would have fetched him and the kind of impact he would have made in society and in the lives of people okay and so I believe strongly that when it comes to this job issue, instead of government always talking about the fact that we will create jobs, we will create jobs. Because even when government creates jobs, the issue is that government cannot even create jobs for half of the population. So we must rather begin to put in place policies and programs and we must also even restructure our educational system because our educational system is certainly not helping us. We need to change our educational system. You go to school, learn 12 subjects, 10 subjects, 11 subjects, and what becomes of you? We need to change our educational system and look at how best we can begin to identify the talents people have. At a young age, at a very young stage, let us begin to identify their talents, their skills, 
their God-given gift. And when we're able to help them to discover that, we empower them for them to be able to add value to it. Now to the leadership issue. Leadership is a two-way affair. The problem we have is not just a leadership problem. It is a problem of leadership and a problem of the followers. I'll tell you why. The reason why I'm saying this is because leadership is like a household. In every household, there's a father, there's a mother, and there are children. In the household, the father has his role that he has to play as the head and the leader of the house. The mother also has her role to play in the household. The children also have their role to play in the household. When the father plays his role and plays it well, and the mother plays her role and plays it well, and the children refuse to play their role, there will be a problem in that household. On the other hand, if the father plays his role well in the household, the children play their role well in the household, and the mother fails to play her role in that household, there will be a problem in that household. If the father refuses to play his role, the mother plays her role, and the children play their role, there would still be a problem in that household. The only way by which that household will progress and will do well and will advance and will develop is when the father plays his role, the mother plays her role, and the children play their role. And it is the same thing that applies to every nation. The government is like the parent and the citizenry are like the children. So the government that represents the parents, because sometimes we even hear our president say that I'll be father for all. So it tells you that the government is like the parents. So if the government that is supposed to be the parent play their role well, we the citizenry who are supposed to be the children refuse to play our role well. We decide to become stubborn. We decide to become truants. Like as, as a father, you send your child to school and the child goes to sit under a tree to play truancy. And as children, we refuse to play our role. We, we, we become stubborn and rebellion, re rebellious. There will be a problem in the nation. How do we, uh, in a way, not, uh, how do we are rebellious without knowing we are rebellious to the structures of the nation? Do we obey laws? Just this evening, just this evening, when I was coming into the studio, mm -hmm. I came with a taxi. When I was coming in, I had to change taxis. Because the taxi that I took, that I was coming with, mm -hmm. we got to a traffic light. The taxi driver stopped. There was this vehicle, this uh, truck that was carrying pure water. And even though the traffic light was red, the driver wanted to cross. And he was behind us. He came to hit our back. Eventually, I had to change taxis. When the traffic light is red, we pass through. Have you observed that in, and I was telling, I was telling the driver, that we sit here in Accra and say that people in the north are not enlightened. But go to the north and you will see that when the traffic light is red, all motorbikes will stop. All bicycles will stop. All cars will stop. We claim we are enlightened in Accra. Yet when the traffic light is red, motorbikes will pass through the red light. Policemen will look unconcerned because it has become acceptable. Bicycles will pass through the red light because it has become acceptable. Some of the text messages were talking about how dirty and filthy Accra is. 
Who has made Accra dirty and filthy? Isn't it you and I? We drink water. When we finish, we throw it through the window. When we, 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 we have some, some uh, uh, trash in our homes, what do we do? Unfortunately, there are even people who defecate in polythene bags and go and throw them in streams and rivers and throw them in gutters, in the drains. And when it rains and it flats, we blame government. Have we even learned any lessons after what happened two years ago, June 3rd, was it June 3rd or June 4th, June 3rd or June, June 4th? 3rd. Have we learned any lesson? The country is still dirty. Filthy. We throw things, we throw, we throw our rubbish. Some, some people even carry their rubbish dump from their homes and go and dump them in the drains. Is that not rebellion? Are we obeying the laws? Can you remember the number of times governments have sacked, AMA has attempted to sack hawkers from the streets. When they sack them, they will come back. When they sack them, they will come back. Even sometimes the hawkers will begin to threaten that, hey, if you sack us, we'll vote for you. Then the politicians will say, hey, let them come back. Okay, let me assess this particular notion. Uh, that is, you made mention of the fact that the citizens kind of act rebellious on the structures. Uh, there's this whole understanding of most of the citizens when it comes to uh, uh, abiding by the rules of this nation, the laws that govern this country, the sovereign laws that govern this nation, that we put you in terms of parenting, like you mentioned, it is this time around, the citizens determine their parents. So is that an erroneous perception to have hold onto by your uh, assertion? No, you see, the, the issue is that I don't de dismiss the fact that the government has a major role to play when it comes to providing leadership for the country. There's no two ways about it. The government has a major role to play. It's just like in every household. The father is the leader of the house and the father is the one who provides vision and direction for the family. Mm -hmm. But if the father decides to provide that direction for the family and the wife or the children refuse to comply, will that household make progress? How many parents whose children go and sit under trees know that their children sit under trees? When I was in secondary school, I had, I had classmates who will not come for class. They won't come for classes. They will not be in the class. Whilst we are having classes, some of them will be sitting under trees. Some of them will be sitting at the dining hall, having conversation with friends and drinking Fanta and Coke and, and Sprite and what have you, having conversations and having a good time. They will not come. They, they only show up in class when there's a class test. How many of these people's parents are even aware that their children are playing truancy? And to the point is that we are supposed to be each other's keeper. Winston, if you're even walking through the streets of Accra and somebody drinks water and drops the sachet on the floor and you attempt to tell the person to pick the sachet uh, that he or she has dropped, pick it up and drop it in a trash bin. If you are not careful, you will be insulted. If you are not careful, the person will ask you that, why? Does Ghana belong to you? Are you the owner of Ghana? Are you the owner of Accra? Why? <laughs> that is a very interesting uh, aspect there. But let me take some messages uh, through the WhatsApp line. Uh, you've been sending your message, you've been sending your submissions, so uh, I have to just take them. Uh, one from RTK from Tamale says, uh, Gridco has been adjudged the best transmission park in Africa by APWA, that is Association Power Utility in Africa. If Gridco is listed on the Ghana Stock Exchange, then it is for parochial interest, just like Vodafone. Hmm. Thank you there. Another one says, uh, President John Mah former President John Mahama has built a solid infrastructure-based economy for Ghana, so President Akufado should focus on services such as paying newly trained teachers and nurses. This is Barnabas uh, sending a message from uh, Sabugu from Wa. All right, then. Thank you, Barnabas. Another one says, what do you think about developing country like Ghana, making education totally free after the senior high level? This is, uh, I think, uh, quite going to be the last topic we're going to be touching on. That has to do with uh, discussion and debate around the 
financial viability of sustaining the free compulsory universal basic education f cube together with the free senior high school uh, policy that has, is about to be enrolled come this year that is in september possibly 2017 uh, 2018 economic year uh, we are looking up to the uh, finance minister to present the budget on the 2nd of March. Uh, definitely, that particular budget will be assessed right here on Policy Deck. So don't forget, this is your most informative, educative, insightful show where we discuss issues from objective perspective. So now, free SHS policy is something that the president indicated in the State of the Nation address. And he's also looking forward to ensuring that um, most of the initially, the costly nature of the educational system is about to be uh, minimized for parents. So I think the angle of perception or approach uh, of the concept is that the burden on the parent, parent to be reduced. But let's assess, are Ghanaians really poor, first of all? And if you are poor, how would you describe uh, poverty in this dimension? And do you think that making education uh, free Economically, there's nothing free. So if that's the case, who is going to bear the huge burden and how are we going to finance such a, uh, a humongous project of this nature for the nation? Thank you very much for the opportunity. Let me start by saying that I think sometime in 2010, we were doing some project somewhere in Adan. And we are trying to do a lot of work in the education sector. And I was in a meeting when somebody came to tell me that a certain woman wants to come and see me. So I asked them to bring the woman in. She came in. She had a little child at her back. And she told me her child is in school, but she cannot afford to pay her child's school fees. And this is at the basic level. She cannot pay her child's school fees. So she wants to come for us to help her pay her child's school fees. As we were talking, her phone rang. She brought her phone out and went outside to receive the call. Immediately she stepped out, I told the people there that this woman does not need help. They asked me why. And I asked them, did you see the kind of phone she's using? I am not even using the kind of phone she's using. The phone she was using at that time probably would be nothing less than 300 or 400 Ghana at that time. And my phone that I was even using probably wouldn't even be more than 100 Ghana at that time. So what I said was that if this woman really, really, really is interested in her child's education, she will sell this phone at 500 cities, go and buy a phone at 100 cities, and still have 400 cities to support the child's schooling. So when she came back after receiving her call, I asked them, woman, why don't you take your child to the government school? Because you know for a fact that, I mean, uh, currently we have free basic education. So why don't you take your child to the basic school? She told me, uh, to, to, to the public school, she told me that. Well, I mean, as I know, the quality of education in the public schools is not good. That is why she has sent her child to the private school. And I told her that I am a product of a public school. My father was in the military, was in the Navy. So we all lived in Burma camp and we all attended public schools. Myself, my siblings, we all attended public schools. Okay. Right from nursery. And so, I mean, if you tell me that the quality is not good, I may not want to agree with you. But the woman still insisted that she wants her child to be in a private school because the quality of education in the, in the public school is not good. On so many occasions, I mean, I, I recall my mother told me a series of stories because my mother also happened to even serve as a district director of education in the Dangbe East District 
and the the district office was in Ada, and she would she 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 told me several stories of how parents will have money, especially mothers, will have money to buy cloth to go and sew for funeral. Mm -hmm. They will have money to be able to go to the salon for the new hairstyle in town. But they will come and complain that they don't have any money for their children's school fees. So for me, I don't think that Ghanaians are poor. That is why they cannot pay their children's school fees. Of course, I admit that there are some people who are poor. There are people that there are people who genuinely need support. Because I mean, my organization, we have helped about two people with scholarships to go to school. Mm -hmm. And so I can attest to the fact that indeed there are people who genuinely need help. But there are some people too who do not need help. Do you know what this means? Tell me. A parent who knows that education is free can even decide to give birth to more children. Because at the end of the day, it is not my responsibility to take care of the children. The state will take care of them. So for me, left to me alone, this free SHS issue should not be come a mass free SHS thing. But it should be a policy that should be there to support those who genuinely cannot afford. Because believe you me, if government says that those who can afford, raise your hands. Those who cannot afford, put your hands down. Everybody will say they cannot afford. Even those who can afford will tell you they cannot afford. So for me, I believe strongly that this free SHS thing, even though it's a good idea, it's a good initiative, but we need to really look at it very critically. Because you know what? Earlier on, you spoke about unemployment. Mm -hmm. We addressed the issue of unemployment. The unemployment figures will even rise the moment we open the floodgates and say SHS from today is completely free. Because mind you, when we make SHS free, it certainly will lead to an increase in enrollment. Students who are home because their parents cannot afford to take them to secondary school will all go to secondary school. The question we must ask ourselves is what next when they finish secondary school? Because when they finish secondary school and they don't have anything to do with the knowledge they have acquired, what becomes of them? Mm -hmm. And so we should not just be looking at the free SHS alone, but we should also be looking at how best they can either continue the education when they are done with their secondary education or how best the nation can even benefit from whatever knowledge or skills they will acquire. And so even for me, I believe that we should even focus more on the technical and vocational skills when it comes to the free secondary school education. Instead of even focusing on the secondary schools, let us focus more attention on the technical and vocational. Because for the technical and vocational, even if they don't proceed to the polytechnic or, or the university, the nation can still benefit from their expertise. Wow, insightful submissions that have been made by Mr. Paul Dropson right here on Policies X Live on BTA. We've spoken at length, we've discussed at length, we've touched on a lot of issues right here on Policy X. Let me take your final messages that came through the water supply, uh, quite a lot of them, but I'll just take the last two. Uh, this says, I think the president uh, is rushing too much with his free education policy. Government is serious business. Mr. President, stop thinking uh, about 2020 election. <laughs> Interesting one there. <laughs> Ghanaians, Ghanaians. Another one says, President uh, John Mama has built. Okay, I think I've taken this already. I have to say thank you so much for sending your messages via the WhatsApp. Let me take a final, uh, briefly, submissions to conclude the message from Mr. Paul Drafson, and then we'll bring the curtains down on the program. So, Drafson, briefly. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that uh, I would want to conclude by saying that we have a new government. People's level of expectations are very high. Very, very, very high. 
And so the government has a responsibility to manage people's expectations. Because if expectations are not managed and managed properly, it may, it may lead to more problems. Because if people know that, oh, now that a new government has come, we are going to get jobs. No, now that a new government has come, we are going to go to school. Now that a new government has come, oh, we can now rent houses, decent houses to live in. If they are not able to do these things, if they are not able to rent decent houses, if they are not able to go to school, if they're not able to get jobs, it will be a massive problem. And so the government has a major responsibility to manage expectations. I know that sometimes politicians may have genuine intentions. I mean, I remember when I was in the university in my final year, I became the president of the Christian Fellowship. And I remember very well that in my acceptance speech, I said that we are going to build a church auditorium. Ambitious promise. Because we didn't have a church building. We didn't have a place of worship. And so I said that we will build a church auditorium where we can fellowship. And it was a genuine, a genuine desire and a genuine, a genuine uh, a project and initiative that I wanted us to do. Guess what? At the time I was handing over, we had only started foundation. Meanwhile, in my acceptance speech, I said <coughs> that we were going to build and complete a church auditorium where we can worship and fellowship. By the time I was leaving, we had only started foundation. Because even getting land alone, only God knows how long it took. Secondly, even though I was already an executive, of course, I still wasn't privileged to know exactly how much money was in the accounts of the fellowship. When I became president, I knew that the funds in the account <laughs> cannot build a church auditorium. But we had to make a conscious effort Responsibility, because I'm sure that definitely whatever promises they might have made, they might have made them with very good and genuine consents. But if taking over, they have realized that some of the promises they gave, it may be a bit difficult to fulfill them immediately, or even it may be a bit difficult to fulfill them at all, they should come out and manage people's expectations. Mr. Paul Robson, thank you so much for that and aside for uh, time with thank you. you for thank you so me. much for making time. We are most privileged to have you this evening. Thank you so much. Uh, viewers, like we always say, we bring you the first discussion right here on Policy Day. My name is Winston Taki. Join me on Friday for another insight for uh, Policy Day discussion right here. Thank you. you enjoy the rest of the evening. Looking for a venue for your wedding reception, conferences and retreats, outside catering, recreation, look no further than Coconut Grove Beach Resort Hotel, located in Elmina, Coconut Grove Hotels, memories worth repeating.